Good morning, everyone. Uh, or if we were at AM, we'd say howdy. I just uh, recently attended my eighth cattle college at AM, and so I was, uh, I was struck by their different form of greeting, but very enthusiastic. I uh, appreciate everyone here this morning. Uh, looks like a good crowd. And uh, I'm not here really so much to teach as I am to uh, try to part to you a few things that I've learned over the years. I uh, no reflection on the theme of the uh, of the conference, but uh, I titled my presentation "Avoiding the Boardroom." But the spelling is not B O A R D; it's B O R E D, because I think that's a very important part of being involved in your job, whatever, wherever that job may be, is to uh, be bought into, so to speak. That's the term we use at John Souls Foods is to, to have a sense of ownership. And so I think it's very important if you are bought into the concept of what the company is trying to do or where it's trying to go uh, that avoids boredom. And boredom is the enemy of a good job, in my opinion. A couple of quotes I wanted to make here. Uh, one of these I read recently uh, from a gentleman who writes in the local paper, uh, Dave Ramsey, name of his company is Dave Ramsey Solutions. And a person had written in talking about a hobby and the hobby had begun to generate quite a bit of money. And, and Dave said, a hobby that makes money is a business. And I was really struck by how that fit with my life and business philosophy because uh, my quote is, uh, creating brings the greatest joy and making a job into a joy brings the most reward. Uh, that's really not my original thought, but put into that format is. What to uh, the above supposedly significant slogans really mean and how can they help you move from birth to death? That all depends on you. Uh, life is really a, what you make it. And uh, what I'm talking about here is to just not go through your life plodding along, living each day, waiting for Friday. Uh, although I'm pretty certain that uh, some of you in this room will do that with your life. But if I can reach a few of you and uh, teach you that there is an alternative to living for Fridays, then I've, uh, I've accomplished my goal. Uh, my problem is that I'm so uh, bought into the fact that work can be joyful that uh, it's sort of my sermon, my mission in life, so to speak, is to try to get as many people as possible to recognize how much joy there is in work. I remember back to my dad who uh, we had a, a celebration of him for his 90th birthday. And one of the comments that I remember uh, most clearly was him standing up there and saying, I've enjoyed every day of my life. Not many people can say that. And, uh, and I think in my dad's case, he genuinely meant what he said. Every day had been a joy for him. He, uh, I called him one time uh, a war horse, and that offended him because he didn't understand what I was meaning. But a war horse is an animal that was, uh, uh, in olden times when men fought on horses, that was their favorite horse because that horse loved battle. And uh, so your war horse was not the horse you rode in the parade. It was the horse that you rode when your life depended on that horse. Uh, my problem, as I said, is this never ceasing need to tell people how much joy there is in work. Uh, how wonderful it really is to wake up every day excited about going to work. Uh, getting 
your job to become your hobby, as Dave Ramsey talks about, is uh, it's easy, but it's really difficult all at the same time. It takes, it takes a buy-in on your part emotionally. Uh, and I'm gonna use as an example of that buy-in communication as a, as a quick side note. Uh, too many people mistake speaking for communication. They think their job is to get the most words out in the shortest period of time. That's really not the object of speech. Uh, speech is uh, being able to get your thought into the other person's mind. So my advice to you going forth in the business world is learn to slow down your speech, articulate, and allow the person's brain that you're trying to convey your thought into a little time to assimilate what you're trying to say. Don't try to get the most words into the shortest period of time. I'm appalled by the, by the people who operate phone centers uh, who seem to have the objective of speaking the most words in the shortest period of time, the most uncomprehendably. And uh, I, d I just don't think that's the purpose of speech. Uh, what I'm really trying to get across is that a few people the fortunate ones, I call them, are able to cause their job to become their hobby and their hobby to become their job. And so you, you meld, to use the old Star Trek term, you meld both of those into one unit. And the joy of that is you're not the guy who works Monday through Friday waiting to go fishing Saturday morning at six o'clock. You're the guy who can't wait to get up on Monday morning because you get to go do your hobby, which is your job. Uh, and the good thing about that is it keeps you out of the boardroom. I, I can't imagine much more unpleasant in life than having to work a job that you're bored at. So that buy-in, I think, is what helps you to avoid that boredom buy into how important your position is in the overall scope of things. And that buy-in creates excitement and that excitement creates confidence and that confidence creates problem solving and problem solving creates advancement. Uh, striving to solve problems will get you occupational advancement faster than anything else you can do, including sucking up to your boss. Solving problems, either by creating or discovering solutions, is the most guaranteed way to get promoted. And as each of you finish your education and you go out into the world, you're gonna discover that someone wants to hire you to solve a problem. That's really the basis of any occupation. Instructors' jobs are to teach knowledge. Your job is to assimilate that knowledge and then apply it. Uh, I, uh, you know, never dreamed I'd be in the food business. Grew up a math science major and uh, was headed to pre-med. And uh, after a few years, I discovered I, I had the sort of the urethral desire, but I really didn't have the study habits. I didn't have motivation. I didn't have the real desire to be in the medical field. Uh, strangely enough, I've, uh, I've in the years uh, that I've been in the food business, made friends with people who are doctors and dentists. And uh, I'm surprised at how many of them don't like their job. Uh, so I'm thankful that that young dream I had didn't mature. Uh, 
solving problems will not only get you promoted, but it'll give you intense personal satisfaction. It's very, very rewarding personally. Job status and advancement are not bad, just as money is not bad. I, uh, I had a, a father who taught me money was not a goal, money was simply a tool. And uh, I thought that was tremendous advice and I've, tr I've tried to remember that. But all of that, job status, the advancement and the reward, it should be simply a measure of how well you perform your job. It ought to be a form of recognition, not a goal. Uh, and a couple of quotes uh, I want to give you. One here is from 13th chapter of Hebrews, the fifth verse. Your, your life should be free from the love of money. I know some people who work strictly for the money. And uh, while some are very successful at it, I really don't know of a single one who's just in love with what they do. Uh, so I would stress to you, don't work your job for your payment. Let your payment be a recognition of how well you do your job. Um, or as I have a, a favorite saying that uh, occurred to me one day when I was driving down the road, don't let your net worth determine your self-worth. Generally speaking, I think society tends to take creators and put them into a, a rather narrow bracket. Uh, we think of a creator as being a sculptor or a writer, or a, a painter. I personally believe that the field of, it, of business has the biggest, broadest, blankest canvas. And anyone in business can be as creative as they desire to be. It's a wonderful, golden opportunity to create. Uh, I couldn't help but remark to myself as I was watching you read people's phones uh, that's foreign to me but you people accept that as a way of life 20 years ago well longer than that 30 years ago i remember reading an article about cell towers and how they would be the new railroad of america uh, at the time i could have invested some money in cell towers uh, but due to the fact that it was so new, I chose not to. Uh, and I don't regret it because what I did choose to do was to focus my investments in things that I knew. Uh, I'm not against passive investors. I think they're the backbone of America. But never fail to keep in mind all the time that your best opportunity is to invest in yourself. Invest in your talent, invest in your time, invest in your ability, because you'll do a better job at what you do than someone else will ever do for you. Uh, one thing I promise you about creating in business is that it will keep you out of boredom and what I call the boardroom. Uh, honestly, everybody wants to be a superstar. The reality is there are not very many superstars in the world. As, as I wrote here, there, there was only one Babe Ruth. There was only one Leonardo da Vinci. But I have, uh, I have been successful in my business endeavors because I believe that every person in a company is important. Not only important, but in many instances, crucial to that company. Uh, our salespeople tend to have rather large egos. 
and I'm constantly having to remind them that as great a salesperson as they might be, they're basically like a ship in the water with no sail and no oar if they don't have production, shipping, order, generation, accounting, all the different functions that together build a successful company. Uh, I've been at the sale of numerous food companies that had beautiful offices, had the latest electronic equipment back in the shop, and yet the work out on the, the machines was shoddy, the plant was unclean, and that's the reason they were failing and being sold off, is because they didn't build a competent team that worked together to build what everybody wants if you buy into, and that's success. You want to build your company, you want it to grow, and everybody who participates in that buy-in concept is, is a creator. They're the leader in their particular position. I, I think if, if I could stress one thing, it's that no matter where you are, you can be the number one person at that spot. Uh, I was having a discussion with my son the other day, and uh, uh, he travels all the well. Both both boys travel all the both men travel all the time. Uh, our business has constantly grown, and it requires quite a bit of travel. Uh, but after a particularly large, successful sale, uh, one of my sons called me and was talking about, you know, his accomplishment. And I said, didn't you mean our accomplishment? He said, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. But, you know, if you're a, if you're a, let's say a star pitcher and you're striving to pitch a perfect game, it's easy to overlook the center fielder who allowed that hit to become an out. And that's what I'm stressing. Uh, when, I, when my son told, was telling me about his great accomplishment, this big sale that he had made, I, uh, I asked him, I said, which part of a chain is the most important part? And uh, being a very aggressive person like he is, uh, his immediate comment was, oh, well, the weakest link. And I said, no, every link is the most important part of a chain because that's what makes a chain. Every link has to do its part. Uh, a salesman tends to think of himself as the hook on the chain. That's what attaches the chain to the object to be moved, in this case, the, the customer. But that hook's useless without every single link in that chain hooked up to the source that's trying to move it. So if you are, as everyone will be in this room, at some point in your life, your career, uh, you're growing a little discouraged. You're thinking, what am I doing here? Think of that chain because every link is essential for a chain to do its job. It doesn't matter how big the hook is, every link has to fit together and pull as a unit. Another thing that occurred to me while I was writing this was a quarterback and uh, Being a Dallas Cowboy quasi fan, uh, I, I couldn't help back to the time, think back to the times that uh, I had seen Tony Romo get blindsided from the left because that uh, particular lineman that's no longer there uh, allowed that uh, defensive player to hit Tony being a right handed passer. He's turning to his right to throw, he's got to have protection over here. So if that lineman fails in his job, it doesn't matter how great the quarterback is. 
And that leads me back to something I want to repeat. Everybody is a leader at their position. If you can, if you can buy into that and remember it, it'll make you great at what you do. It will give you guaranteed advancement. And uh, not only will it get you recognition from your boss, but eventually it may get you the boss's job. Because sooner or later, everybody has to move up. That's an inevitable fact of business. Whatever you do, resolve to be the best at that job. Imagine what problems are there. How can I help to solve those problems? How can I either discover a solution or create a solution? This, uh, as I watched you register this, some of the participants here off their phone, I was thinking about something I'd read recently that uh, I don't recall, but it's an enormous percent, like 70% maybe of the financial transactions in China take place by phone. People don't even carry that much money. Uh, and that is a dynamic uh, economy. Uh, about 15 years ago, I took a church, uh, it was actually a church trip, but it wasn't supposed to be church related. But we went to China and spent about three weeks and uh, had opportunity to speak with a lady who was a member of the party over uh, a province about the size of Texas, primarily ag based. And uh, she was telling me, she said, China is trying an experiment in history. We're trying to combine a totalitarian governmental system with capitalism as an economic system. We in America tend to think capitalism is a political system, but it's really not. It's really just economics. It's the, it's the function of business. And uh, they have recognized, they being the country of China, has recognized how effective capitalism is. Uh, you folks here that are in the school of business, uh, I'm assuming you're all in the school of business. Um, you know, you're about to enter into the biggest engine in the world. Uh, it's kind of like uh, somebody who's gone from a Volkswagen to an Indy 500 car. That's what the school of business is. That's what the business world is. It's dynamic. It's evolving. It's never the same. It's incredibly interesting. It pulls you like a freight train. Uh, it's good to be reactive. It's good to be proactive. If you get into the school of business, you're going to be some of both because it's going to move fast. And yet the economy is so big that it moves slower than we think. One of my observations is you see the news and you think, oh my gosh, blah, blah, blah. Well, blah, blah, blah never happens. Not now. It might take three months, it might take six months, it might take two or three years. Uh, but it's all driven by economics and economics is really driven by the human. We as people have desires, we have needs and, and business allows society to satisfy those needs to meet the needs and the requirements of living, breathing, clothing, housing, transportation, entertainment. I think I'm about to lose my... Uh, and a thought I'd like to, to give you is to sort of think of, of business in terms of time because time's the single most important thing we all have. Matter exists in three stages, solid, liquid, and gas. Uh, at sometimes 
solids are actually gassing off. They're not going into a liquid state. But I tend to, in my mind, I tend to equate solid, liquid, and gas with past, present, and future. Uh, you don't need to live in the past, but never lose sight of it because they're valuable lessons from the past. You want to try to live in the present because that's the most precious thing you have is this moment. But you want to always try to be striving to be prepared for the future. And that's the gas. It's pretty elusive. But you can actually do more with gas than you can with liquid or with solid. They're, from a physical standpoint, they're more stubborn than gas. So gas is pliable. So if you're sitting at your desk having an idle thought, think about your time. Think about the fact that my present is my liquid. My future is my gas. That gas can be compressed. It can be, you can do a lot with it. You can drive an engine, steam, steam power generation. You can do tremendous things with gas. So you can do tremendous things with your future. Uh, the present is important and you have to live in it, but always keep sight of the fact that it doesn't take very long for the present to become the past and the future to become the present. I read a, I read a quotation recently that I wanted to leave with you and this is similar to uh, a quotation I read uh, by an author named Mark McCormick. And uh, he was, uh, oh my gosh, I had a blank moment. Uh, a very famous Ar Arnold Palmer. He was Arnold Palmer's agent back when athletes really first began to have uh, agents. General Powell said, a dream doesn't become reality through magic. It takes sweat, determination and hard work. Mark McCormick, who wrote a really great book, in my opinion, called What They Don't Teach You in Harvard Business School, said, you've heard work long and work hard, but I'm telling you, you also have to work smart. And to tie into that concept of working smart, I think you gotta always, Keep your time in mind. Accomplish as much as you can in the present, being prepared for the future, and not lose sight of your past. The things you did wrong, the things you did right, learn off your experiences. Uh, and I'm gonna tie this time concept in with part of my personal conviction and the foundation for my business. It comes also from the book of Hebrew, 13th chapter, the eighth verse. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So you see how that addresses the three stages of matter and the three aspects of time. I just think that's one of the most brilliant verses out of the entire Bible. And also out of 1316, don't neglect to do what's good and to share. If you don't have money as a goal, it makes it a whole lot easier to share. When you share, you build a team. When you build a team, you can create great things. I want to leave you with a final thought. And I grew up as a young guy thinking <laughs> this came from my grandfather. Did some research and I found it was on Ronald Reagan's desk. It was on Harry Truman's desk. It actually goes back to a monk in the 1800s who's first quoted as having this thought. But I'm sure it wasn't his original thought. Uh, there's no limit, and, and this has been said multiple different ways, but the gist of it, as my 
as my grandfather used to say, I, I quoted this for years to people saying, this is my grandfather's thought, but he was just repeating, he'd read it somewhere. There's no limit to what a person can accomplish if they don't care who gets the credit. That ties to me, that ties back with not having money as your goal. If you, if you don't have money as a goal, I think generally along with that, you pick up a degree of humility and you, you reduce the size of your ego. And when you can reduce your ego, you're willing to give up credit. You're willing to give up notoriety. You're willing to give up uh, being thought of as uh, an, an instigator of a great concept. The people who really accomplish things are people who have created a team. They've allowed the team to take the credit and they're willing to sit back and share the results of that creation. So with that said, uh, take some questions. Yes, Adam. I didn't. It was purely an accidental job. Well, I, uh, I drove, I was in college for a long, long time. I drove a truck, had a great job at the freight docks, went to college in the morning, drove a truck and worked, worked freight. Uh, was in grad school for, I don't know, three or four years. Finally decided, well, the only thing I can do with that is get a doctorate. And I'd been in school for about, I don't know, 11, 12 years at that point. And I just said, I, I, I'm burned out. And so I took a job that required my degree, discovered pretty quickly that I was uh, bored stiff with it didn't like to work, certainly didn't like the standards that I was forced to do my job under, which was not treat people fairly. And so after a pretty brief stint there, year or so, I quit and uh, moved to, back to East Texas where I'm originally from and uh, took this job with my uncles to uh, support my family while I found what I wanted to do. And lo and behold, in a very short period of time, I discovered, wow, I love the activity. I'm a physical type guy. I'm not a, I, I'm clerically disadvantaged. You know, I don't like sitting at a desk. I don't like doing paperwork. I like being out active, moving. I like physical. Uh, my counselor says, well, you're, you're ADHD with a dusting of bipolar. And I said, oh, my, that doesn't sound good. She said, oh, that's not a bad combination if you handle it right. So, uh, you know, I came into this job, uh, just literally fell in love with it. And, um, and the rest is the result of what uh, a great team is. Uh, people, people ask me a lot. Did you ever envision, and I always do, I say no before they even finish the sentence, because no, I didn't envision. I set goals, yes, but basically what I did was, okay, we've got to do this today. I know tomorrow we've got to do that. Let's do the same thing tomorrow that we did today that were successful. Let's not do the things tomorrow that we did today that weren't successful. But above all, if, if I have a talent, it's it's a God-given talent for spotting talent in other people. And many times I have interviewed someone, seen the talent in that person. And uh, I remember one guy in particular who had a master's in statistics who had moved here from Boston and uh, didn't speak East Texas like I do. Uh, and I hired him. And uh, my son, uh, John Jr. said, Dad, you, you, you gotta be crazy. We don't have anything that Bill can do. And I said, this is a really smart, talented guy. The job will find him. Well, lo and behold, some few years after that, we picked up Walmart. Walmart's accounting 
model is that the supplier basically manages the product from raw material to the customer walking out the door. They don't do anything. You handle it all. You, you, you buy your materials, you make your product, you ship it to the DCs, you ship it out of the DCs. It better be just enough to fill all the orders, but you better not have very much throwaway. All that turned out to be statistical based. And we became so good at doing it because of this guy from Boston we'd hired that Walmart wind up saying, we, we want you to send Bill around. We want him to teach classes of people how to do what you do. So there's a, there's a classic example in my mind of go for the talent. The job shows up. The job seeks out that talent. And, and all of you, your objective is to be the most talented person at your spot. Solve the most problems. Oh, that's a good one. Uh, I wish I had a concrete one, but I don't. I'm sorry. Uh, you know, we've been very, very fortunate to uh, to have great financial officers. We've had minimal bad debts. Uh, I've had people call up and say, I mean, imagine this, buyers of a major corporation call up and say, you guys made a mistake on your invoice. You didn't charge me enough for this product. Or, you know, you delivered me a hundred boxes too much. Uh, I just feel like I've just had a blessed life and a, and a blessed career. So uh, I don't, I don't know if uh, my dad always said, "Well, everybody has twenty twenty hindsight." I look back and things have gone so well for my company and the group of people that have made that company great that uh, I'd be scared to say anything's a mistake, you know? I'm sorry, say that again, please. Oh, uh, I would say one person has as much as another. What it really takes to make a successful business is have a good product, be fair and honest, work hard, employ good people. Uh, there's a program actually, uh, UT is, is doing a, I guess you call it the junior entrepreneurial program with a couple of high schools. Uh, here in, in Tyler. And uh, in speaking with, uh, with one of the uh, headmasters yesterday involved in that program, I was, I was talking to him about another program that's actually becoming very successful in the Texas prison system called PEP, the Prison Entrepreneurial Program. Some psychologist, and I don't recall her name, but she's written a pretty, pretty well-received book, said that, strangely enough, most of the really outstanding criminals were brilliant business people who just didn't ever start off on the right foot. They had the drive. They had the determination. They had the intelligence. They had the people skills. They just started in the wrong spot. Uh, and so they're teaching people to learn a trade, invest in themselves, uh, do good work, and they're discovering that, I think this is the right word, recivitism, returning to prison, is almost zero in these people that have gone through this program. 
whereas it's, I think, in the 70s among people that have not. Uh, so to start, no, you don't have to have anything. My gosh. You know, my, our, our plant to start was half the size of this room. Uh, you just got to be willing to work hard. You got to be willing to do the right thing, even when it hurts. Employ good people. Don't be afraid to get rid of bad people because you really do have to keep the quality of your workforce up. Uh, you know, one of my one of my roommates in college uh, came up. I don't know, ten or fifteen years ago, and I hadn't seen him in years. And uh, he was born into a fairly well-off family, but really his father was a self-made man. wasn't anything magical that Dwight did. And in the course of our catching up. He bragged to me, uh, let me see, this was my, I can't think what birthday it was, but it was maybe 20 years ago. So my 55th or 60th or whatever it was, uh, Dwight said, you'll be pl glad to know that I've never worked a day in my life. And I, I just closed my eyes and processed that. And I thought, how empty your life has been. If you take joy in the fact that you've never contributed, that you've taken from society your entire life, how unfulfilled and empty your life's got to really be. Uh, there's another article that I would like to, I didn't write this down, but <clears throat> I tell people, uh, you know, I, out of my sons, both my sons, well, my two sons and my stepson, all three graduated from UT Austin. Uh, Mark, the older one, who's the salesman, got his degree in marketing. John got his degree in, in uh, accounting and international business. Matthew got his in IT. Um, out of Matthew's, I learned how really ignorant of the electronic age I am. And that's probably, if I had to say I've made a mistake, it would be not becoming more electronically uh, friendly or, or knowledgeable. Uh, because that really does, uh, it's, I'm glad you asked that question that uh, I've been looking for motivation to take some classes. Uh, out of John's, I learned a concept called opportunity cost. And when John came to me in the year 2000 and he said, uh, and understand our business started really as a hamburger producing plant. We were not fajitas. And uh, we got into fajitas as a sideline because we had a steak plant down in Troop. And Mark said back in the, gosh, early 80s, Dad, there's a new product coming out called fajitas. And I said, what? And he started telling me about them. And at that time, believe it or not, inside and outside skirts, which is the constituent of fajitas, was going for dog food and it was selling for 15 cents a pound. So look what an industry has come about off of somebody's invention or creation, as I like to say. So in the year 2000, John came to me and he said, Dad, something uh, Tom and I want to talk to you about. I said, okay, what's that? He said, we want to resign ground meat. And at that time, ground meat was probably $25 million a year in sales. And I remember very distinctly, I said, John, you're asking me to shoot my firstborn. And he said, well, I, I knew you were going to say that, Dad. Tom and I have talked about it. And he said, we want to show, show you the opportunity cost of not resigning ground beef. Well, in 10 minutes, he had shown me how much it was going to cost if we still continued to do this $25 million a year in sales. And, uh, and I said, oh, that's a real good explanation there. 
And so we resigned it that year. And what it allowed us to do is to really, that was the year 2000. It really allowed us to grow in a field that we were better at. We had less competition and a lot higher profit margin. The thing I, I would ask all of you in this room to read is an article out of the 1976 Harvard Business Review. Uh, I don't recall the author, but it's the title of the article, if I remember correctly, is What They Don't Teach You in Harvard Business School. And uh, no, I'm sorry. Sorry. Uh, that's Mark McCormick. Uh, it's called Marketing Myopia. You ever heard of the article? Incredibly, incredibly eye opening thing to read. Because what I discovered when I read that was I thought I was in the manufacturing business. And I would go to customers and say, here's my product list. What, what off my list can I sell you? After I read Marketing Myopia, I understood for the first time I was really in the service business. And my job was to go to a customer and try to help that customer solve a problem, to be of service to them. And when I stopped going to customers and saying, here's my list, and going and saying, what problem do you have that I might help you solve? Literally, the world opened up. I mean, I remember Mark telling me, Dad, you need to read this. Professor whatever said, nobody should graduate from business school in America without having read this article. And it goes, I mean, it, it goes back to the railroads and the demise, not demise, but diminishment of the railroads because they fail to realize their true place in the marketplace uses lots of really good examples. But that was really an eye opener for me. And I would encourage every one of you to, to read that article. Um, any more questions? Yes. Um, well, some advice I might give you is number one, time is on your side in solving that problem because that type of person, it doesn't take long, doesn't take much time for that type of attitude to show up. And pretty soon you're going to see him replaced demoted, ostracized, uh, I think time would handle that. Uh, or you might be faced with the decision of, uh, you know, this is, this is maybe not my spot. And those are not easy decisions. It, you know, it was very, very difficult when I uh, quit this job that I had put all my uh, I thought at the time, put all my education into. Uh, but, but it was a time when I said, you know, this is not for me. I, I need to be somewhere else. A uh, couple other things I would suggest as students. This is the most opportune time of your life. Don't restrict your studies to just one field. Um, I w second answer to your question of what do I regret? I regret not having taken more business classes. I took business 101 at North Texas because I was a pre-bed major and that elective fit my time schedule. Uh, 
later working at Waterloo Blood Bank one summer, I spoke with a, a, a guy who was fixing to graduate from dental school. And I said, what regrets do you have? He said, oh my gosh, I wish I'd taken business classes. He said, I fixed to go out and be a dentist and earn a great living and I won't be able to manage my own money. Uh, at a wedding one time, I ran across Tony Dorsett and he said, my biggest regret is that I knew nothing about handling the money that I made while I was a football star. Uh, and, and he said, and I'm broke today because a crooked accountant misappropriated all my money. Strangely enough, in the meat business, I discovered, golly, all that algebra I took in high school and college really did help me because that's how I figured fat to lean ratios was algebra. Uh, physics, incredibly important part of life is just understanding how things work and why they work and why things fall over and why they don't and why things slide and why they don't. Of course, it's the friction and center of gravity and lever action and all that stuff. Physics is incredibly important. I would say nobody in the business world ought it not, they ought not to get out of school without having taken a physics class. Because I have found that's one of the most important classes uh, the knowledge that I learned, uh, I mean, I never cease to use the principles of physics. So I would encourage all of you to take some of that. Uh, golly, I've, I've majored in English, psychology, uh, pre-med, government, history, philosophy, I, I wouldn't take back any class I took because something I got out of it proved to be real beneficial later in life. Um, any more questions? Yes, Adam. Yeah. Well, I would say you keep one foot in the present and one foot in the future. Uh, it, when, when you were asking your question, what popped in my mind was um, I took a Bible study course called BSF, Bible Study Fellowship. And it's a seven year rotation. I, for 14 years, I took these classes you look forward to the New Testament with great anticipation. You look forward to the Old Testament with some trepidation because it's pretty dry. But, uh, you know, there are always lessons to be learned no matter how dull it might appear. You just got to stay alert. You got to stay involved. You got to stay bought in. You know, don't, don't look at a class that you take or, or a student as, uh, something you have to endure. Look at that class as this is an opportunity. I may not get but one thing out of this class, but that one thing will stay with me forever. Uh, that business 101 class, I did learn one very important thing, and I can't tell you hundreds of times that it's entered my mind. Of all the businesses that start, at the end of a year, of 100 businesses, 90 are gone. Over the next four years, of those 10 that are left, nine are gone. There's a 1% success ratio. The reason that most of them fail in the first year is because they're undercapitalized or it's the wrong idea or the wrong set of talents. I mean, there are a lot of factors that cause that first year failure. Over the next four years, the reason most of them fail is because the owners can't keep their hands out of the cash register. They rob the company. When you start robbing the company, it's like taking food out of your baby's mouth. 
you have to consider your business as your baby. You got to feed that baby before you feed yourself. To be successful in business, you've really got to have the concept that I will, as Gus is fond of saying, I take a bullet for John Soul's Foods. You have to have that attitude. You have to take food out of your mouth to put it in the baby's mouth. I mean, it's kind of a parental altruistic type relationship. Uh, biggest mistake I would say, the worst advice my dad gave me as the company was growing was, man, I'd be living out of that company. I'd be doing this. I'd be doing that. And I thought he's worked for humongous. Uh, you, you people may have read it in your business history, a company called Gulf and Western. Oh my gosh, they owned just humongous companies. They owned Paramount, yeah. My dad used to be on the set of all these movies when they were insuring Paramount, did Sound of Music and John Wayne and, you know, I've got great stories. He, he always ruined the TV shows because he would say in Bonanza, well, they're fixing to roll that tree around the corner there. And sure enough, you know, you'd look down and boop, there were the rollers. So, uh, uh, but he looked at it from a big point of view, a macro view, and that's important, but it's not, I guess, maybe not as relevant. You have to, to, to run a business successfully. You got to look at it from a microscopic point of view. And while you might want to pay yourself more money or live a more lavish style, it's not the best thing for the company because it's really important as you grow to never lose sight of the fact that your cash flow needs only grow with the volume of sales. So you just have to take care of the baby first. All right, well, thank you very much. Appreciate you. Did I miss one? Well, all right, thank you very much. And good luck to you all.